All right, we are back here on the Watch It podcast, segment number two here. I almost said hour number two, like I'm doing live radio. Torres Finney, the Punisher himself, joining us here. What's going on, man? What's going on, Jake? How you doing today, brother? I'm doing good, man. I feel like it's it's been a minute since you've been on, but it really was only like three weeks ago. Oh, man, it's, fu- it's funny you say that because time go by so fast. And uh, three weeks ago, we were still searching for me an opponent. So uh, <laughs> now things change. And uh, now in what? It's going on, what, 10 days? Uh, nine days, and I'll be fighting, so uh, I'm excited. Yeah, tell me a little bit about what happened there when, when with the, in the opponent search. I, I heard a little bit about this through the grapevine, but I, you had to move up a couple weight classes, huh? Uh, yes, man. It's been really interesting. You know, uh, we went through a lot of opponents, me and my agent, uh, Ray Horner, for first-round management, um, and also the promoter for Aries, Tim Lloyd. They went through a lot of different opponents, uh, a lot of different 185ers, and um, – We kept getting the same answer. Uh, (laughs) I have so many different messages uh, uh, that they sent me, and I'm looking. I'm like, man, he said this. Like, I got one, your muscle's too big, or uh, I'm not ready for you yet, or uh, give me a few more fights, or I need more money. And it's just a whole bunch of different things. And uh, at this point, um, even though, like, an uh, active fighter, which is different than boxing, I really want to explain that to a lot of people, but an active fighter is like three to four fights for MMA. That's a lot of fights, mm-hmm. if people don't understand. That's a lot of fights. Where in boxing, you see some guys, they fight early on in their career. They can fight six, seven, eight, almost to ten times in one year. And, you know, you be like, oh, that's a lot of fights. Well, compared to MMA, that's unheard of. Uh, four to five, six, seven, like, if you make it even that many, that's a lot of fights. Uh, so four fights is a lot of fights for an active fighter. And I want to stay active. I haven't fought since February. I want to fight in June. The goal is to try to get another one in August. And if we can't get a fourth one, we'll try to target probably October. Um, but I want to stay active. I want to fight. And I was like, man, just give me anybody now at this point. Like, forget the weight <laughs> class. It don't even matter about the weight class anymore. So then we go up to 205. We had a guy in accept, but then literally the next day he pulled out. Yeah. And then we got another 205 or two potentially except then he was like nah just not it for me so i'm like i can't even get 205 look just give me heavyweight (laughs) (laughs) just give me anybody and uh man we finally found somebody and uh, i'm excited uh to fight so who who are you going against uh his name is jake zog he's from uh chicago illinois uh he's a heavyweight uh he has a lot of fights on his belt um he's uh fought uh the last time he fought um that in, in this area in Tennessee, he fought in Chattanooga uh, last year. Uh, he came up short in that one. Uh, he uh, got retired on the stool. He couldn't get off the stool in that one. It was a heavyweight bout, and those big boys were going back and forth. They both were, like, going at it. And um, he also fought Lorenzo Hood. If anybody knows him, uh, Lorenzo fought Jake Zog. His last regional fight, it was for uh, uh, a regional fight here in promotion for Tennessee. I was there. And... He fought him, and uh, now he Lorenzo Hood's in the UFC. So uh, Jake Zog don't fought some, you know, tough competition. So, um, you know, he's no slouch. He's no walkover. But, uh, you know, you, you got to go in there. He's got, I'm, I'm sure he's going to come in there and do his thing. But I feel like this against any opponent I've ever fought, anybody I've ever went against throughout my whole life. If I go in there and do me, um, I feel like nobody can beat me. So, um Obviously, I'm ready for him. Whatever he's bringing to the table, I'm ready. But if I do me, if I fight my game, if I establish my game, I don't feel like anybody can beat me. So so tell me about, you know, if you can't find the fight in the first weight class, move up. That's understandable. But moving up two, how does that change the, the training regimen behind everything? Because you're not necessarily cutting anymore at that point, are you? You're, you're gaining more. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing is, so like, you know, if anybody see me, obviously y'all see me. So like, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a heavier guy anyway. Uh, you know, I I still have some of that football weight on me anyway. Uh, when I played at UTC, used to walk around 230. Um, the heaviest I got to, that was at the worst time. But I all got all the way up to 250 one time. That was ooh. So, uh, but I was I was you know big. I was strong. And um, right now I'm not cutting. Right now I walk around 211. You know. 210 sometimes the heaviest i get sometimes is like the 214 um but i walk around that area so i'm not cutting you know and i feel really good i train the same way i train because if i was getting ready to cut the 185 right now i'll be around 200 or 201 
And then next week I start like really like getting down. And then like I usually start the initial cut, like the sauna cuts from 197, mm-hmm. 198. Like cut 13, 12 pounds and um, get 185. And it's been a piece of cake the past few times I've done it. So I'm not too much worried about that getting down. But right now I'm just, you know, cruising, eating whatever I want to eat. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, making sure I'm staying in shape. I'm doing the right things, you know, staying in shape, training. I still train three times a day. So that, that's nothing uh, different to me. Uh, my workout regimen, uh, me training. I just got done doing jiu-jitsu today. I uh, got two more classes later on today myself. So um, I'm always still training as if it, regardless if I'm cutting or not cutting, I'm still going to be training the same way. So um, nothing really has changed besides what I eat. <laughs> yeah. So th- nothing different about, you know, the jujitsu, the striking and still saying the same game. Plan. Yeah. The, the game plan. Yes. I, like I said, I'm, I'm more of an offensive fighter is I fight very similar to the way I wrestled. I was offensive. I've never was a guy too much on my back foot. Um, I was the one that liked to go forward. I'm the one that likes to be the aggressor, the one that dictate. Uh, so I just want to be that person that does that. And by doing that, I don't think whatever your game plan is should affect my since I'm the one that's going to mm-hmm. be doing the dance. I'm the one that's going to be controlling the dance. Um, and it's up to you. Can you stop it? And you, can you control the dance? Can you uh, make me do what you want to do? And that's the that's the way I feel like uh, you have to beat me and I – I just think that's going to be really tough for anybody to be able to do that. I feel like that mindset's huge, especially going into a heavyweight fight where, you know, even the UFC and Bellator and just all around, I've noticed that sometimes the heavyweight fights, they start off in these big explosive exchanges and then they quickly die back down. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing, and you're also going into this not having to do any kind of cut or anything. So Mm -hmm. do you view that as an advantage, you constantly being the aggressor, going against someone who's predominantly fought at heavyweight? Yes, uh, I really do. Um, You know, not against, nothing too heavyweights in in any type of fashion but you see some heavyweights they really struggle on cardio in in some aspects now you got some good heavyweights that got good cardio i'm not taking saying that like you do <laughs> we, heck we just saw the heavyweight championship go all five rounds oh yeah cyril gone and francis Ngannou, where nobody thought Nagano was ever going to make it to the fifth round like at all <laughs> you know he made it against steve a but we didn't think now like we thought man the only way Nagano could win he has to knock him out the gun who won a decision fight. That's crazy. So you see things like that, and you're like, oh, man, well, some heavyweights. But you see a lot on the regional scene, and you see a lot on even, like, high school wrestling or even, like, boxing. You're like, mm-hmm. heavyweights, first round. I mean, my goodness. They're going yeah. at it. They got it in the tank. They can. They are top of the world. All right. Depending on how long that first round is, they start to dwindle down. Or if we make it to the second round, you see a drastic difference (laughs) than what you saw in the first. And I think that's the difference maker when you see between a lot of these fights. I mean, you look at guys like, you know, um, Derrick Lewis. So now the thing with Derrick Lewis, Derrick Lewis' power carries throughout the later rounds. Now, is he throwing as many strikes as he was in the early rounds? Not a chance. But, his power, his power carries, so you have to be mindful. You can't start turning up the pace on him too much because if he catches you that one time, we've seen multiple times, mm-hmm. you can still be put out. So Remember that's, that Curtis Blades. The Curtis Blades. <laughs> there you go. The uh, 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 um, Alexander Volkov, mm-hmm. you know, another one. You know, he just caught him. And that's the thing is, like, you watch things like that and you see that you have to be mindful of the heavyweight's power. So you got to be mindful of that. And that's one thing I'm going to be mindful of. Uh, but my opponent, he's actually more of a grappler than a striker in a way. So, Interesting. Um, um, but I, I've grappled a lot of big guys <laughs> when I was, I had grappled a lot of big guys at a gogi now. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, I've wrestled when I was wrestling at 195 in high school, I used to wrestle 220. I've wrestled a heavyweight a few times. I actually got a match on YouTube, me going against a 300 pound wrestler at 195. <laughs> and, you know, I beat him in overtime, hard to take him down, but that's how I beat him. I had to take him down in overtime. Yeah. So, um, but man, I, I went against a lot of like, you know, big guys and, you know, playing football, playing Division One football. So like when I see size and like, uh, I mean, I'm always like size only means so much when it comes to skill. Mm-hmm. So your skills still have to be there. And that's the only thing I really look at towards. So um, I'm not too much uh, worried in that factor um, about the size advantage. Um, I've always been a smaller guy. So. And yeah. when people look at me like, you always been a smaller guy? Well, in height differential, yes. Or, But I feel like I have just as long as length and I'm just as strong. I, I've never been 
phased by the the size advantage. So. Yeah, I, I want your take on something. This is kind of the bigger picture of MMA and combat sports in general when it comes to heavyweight. I've talked about this a couple times on this podcast that when I feel like when people hear the name heavyweight, they hear the division, they hear all these things, all these things start coming to mind. You have Muhammad Ali, you have Joe Frazier, you have Francis Ngannou, you have these giant names. And, and do you feel like when you are fighting a heavyweight or when the heavyweight conversation comes up that there is this, there's a little bit more eyes on it than there is with some of those other divisions? Or do you think that's just some kind of you know thing out there? Yes, well, because when they, when they say you're the heavyweight champion, you're the baddest man on the planet. Mm -hmm. The reason why you're the baddest man on the planet because you're in the biggest weight class. <laughs> and, you know, just just the thing with people, they just think size means everything. But it's not really the case, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, yes, I mean, the heavyweight division has do, does has a lot of eyes on it. And, um, you know, anytime the heavyweights are going at it, everybody's like, oh, who's the heavyweight? Oh, okay, <laughs> here we go. Uh, but, man, you got to think about it. Like, heavyweights come in all different shapes and sizes. I mean, just as much as you can out of – you got a heavyweight that's got to cut the 265. You got heavyweights that are already there at 220 or 230, you know, mm -hmm. and just moving around with it. Yeah, look at Stipe, you know, or look at uh, guys like D DC or, I mean, heck, like John Jones, you know, he's moving up to heavyweight yeah. now. So uh, you, got, you got some heavyweights that are not all relatively all that big. But, um, you know, you look at another example like Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson wasn't a big heavyweight, yeah. uh, but man, he hit like one. <laughs> man, did he hit like one? So you you look at those type of things, and you like, man, it's not necessarily too much about size; it's about the skill as well. And I think if you really get a good, strong guy in that division that can move just as well, that are just as strong as a lot of those heavyweights, you got you a guy in a, in a really good package, and it's gonna be hard to beat. You know, that's why. You know, you look at a guy like Francis, I mean, he moves really well for his size. And, I mean, now he's starting to learn a little bit more about grappling and, you know, getting his grappling up along with his power. He's going to be a hard guy to handle mm -hmm. that. That's when I was like, you know, I have to see John Jones fight at heavyweight first mm -hmm. before I would like to see him go against Nagano. But if he wants to step in the fire fast, go, props to him. But man, <laughs> you know, you would like to feel that stuff out, yeah. you know. So. It'll be interesting. Where do you stand on John Jones? Are you still on the John Jones train? It just has been so long at this point. I I, I don't know where I'm at anymore on it. Uh, well, I don't. I mean, I understand all his problems, all the PDs, all that type of stuff. But he's still the. In my opinion, he's still the MMA goat. Yeah, you think so? He, I think he. Now you can make a case for other people. Obviously, there's a lot of other cases. GSP. G. Oh, no question. <laughs> you can make a case for GSP easily. Um, yeah. You can make a case for Fedor. You can make a case for Habib. You can make a case for uh, Mighty Mouse. A lot of people mm -hmm. forget on him. Um, heck, depending on what Hiran Cejudo does coming back, I mean, hey, got a little case. There's a conversation. There's a conversation there. Um, there's a lot of guys you can make. Uh, Anderson Silva. Um, there's a bunch. Uh, but to me, you look at John Jones, his line of work, I mean, I have went through the list one time. i I never forget this. I had went through the list uh, once before and I looked at who John Jones had beaten on his way to like towards like before, when he was in the light heavyweight division when the light heavyweight division was at its max all right and I'll go through this list and I love it so you look at Ryan Bader okay Ryan Bader's you know he's currently the Bellator heavyweight champion Bellator light heavyweight champion as well not not light heavyweight but heavyweight currently uh Marcia Rua Quentin Jackson. Uh, think about it. These are all finishes, either by submission or TKO. Leota Machida, Rashad Evans, Vitor Belfort, Shale Sonnen, Alexander, Alexander Gustafson, Glover Teixeira, who's the current <laughs> champ right now, DC, OSP, DC again, Alexander Gustafson the second time, and then he finished him. That was a great fight. That was. That was. And I'm like, you look at this list, you're like, my gosh. And I'm like, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer. I mean, Constantly, mm -hmm. and he beat all those guys in some of their best at their best times. And I look at John Jones. I'm like, man, <laughs> what is the question? And a lot of people are like, well, look at his last few fights. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can make a case for um, uh, Dominic Reyes. Yeah, did he beat him? When I first watched it, I thought he did. I did. Mm -hmm. I did think Reyes did beat him. Um, but you know. Look, the man is standing the test of time. He went against a lot of guys. He went against the, the prime time guys, the top tier guys. Then he went against the younger guys that are coming mm -hmm. up, and he's beaten them all. He's beaten them all. You know, now 
He's going up to heavyweight. We'll see what he does. I I will say this. If he gains that heavyweight title, I think it's no more a question. Undisputed go. Undisputed go. Okay. I don't think it's no more a question because if he has to beat Naganu, and let's just say he beats Stipe, you know, now nah, even though I know this isn't prime Stipe, I don't I just don't think this Stipe is the Stipe that we used to watch. I agree. Um but he, he probably will add Stipe to his record. So be it. And then if he beats Naganu, who is currently in his prime, I don't I don't think there's no more. I don't what is there to say? Because if John Jones wasn't there, DC would be the light heavyweight goat, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I think DC would have been the man. But DC just had to consistently keep running into <laughs> John Jones, you know. And and D and DC was one of my favorite fighters. Like I actually, I actually like to like you know, I emulate some of my game after him. I really like DC a lot. DC, you know, beat um uh Anthony Johnson and uh you know Derek Lewis and um you know Anderson Silva, even though that wasn't too much of a good fight. Yeah. But uh, Alexander Gustin, you know that fight. You know he uh, Roy Nelson. <laughs> you know DC don't beat a lot of top tier guys himself. You know Stipe himself as well. So, but overall, I think John. If John if John Jones makes it to heavy, whenever he fights at heavyweight, I hope it's by the end of this year. But whoever he fights, I think they're trying to make that Stipe in his fight. You know, basically they're easing him into the heavyweight division. And Stipe is no easy fight. Let's, no. let's not let's not say that. But uh, I think he beat Stipe. I just he just got too, it's just too many weapons mm-hmm. for John Jones. I just think he beat Stipe. And if he beat Stipe, it'd be next in line for the heavyweight title, and everybody be ready to see that'll be the like once again it's the heavyweight championship, exactly. and everybody gonna have their eyes on it because it's the heavyweight fights. That's the reason why they usually put the bigger weight classes above. The smaller weight class, unless their names are that much bigger. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, if you're in the straw weight, fly weight, uh, bantam weight, you're not. You're gonna down get, there. Yeah, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're not gonna get pit above a middleweight, welterweight. You know, unless yeah, the fight is that much bigger. Like if it's a McGregor fight, those are like you're gonna get up there. You're gonna get up there. <laughs> but if it's not, then it's nah. They're not putting you above it. I think what develop that theory for me was I, w- I would have a lot of people over to watch the cards at my apartment and, and it was most people I would say nine out of ten of the people who were there didn't really watch MMA regularly or any kind of combat sports regularly but then you know they would do Bruce Buffer would do the intro you know John Anik would come on Rogan would be on and they're like a heavyweight this heavyweight that and it was like everybody just diverted their attention to that because they just hear the words heavyweight and it's like oh my god now we're gonna get this battle between these titans basically over here and then that's that's the thing it's like with heavyweight i i understand they get gassed quickly but in a sense that makes it more exciting because it is kind of this race against the clock here at this point because both guys at some point are gonna get gassed Mm -hmm. in some instances that's true but then you have francis and ganu who you know the cardio wasn't all the way there in the Mm -hmm. zero gone fight but what we saw going into the whole buildup of that fight with Nganu was this is the man with the most powerful punch in the world. This is how it's going to happen. It was all these predictions, round one, round two. Mm-hmm. And then he starts grappling. And, and everyone was like, what is happening right now? I thought the, I think the odds for, like, when it like, plus 5,000 for Nganu to win by decision? It was astronaut. I don't know if that was the exact number, but yeah, it was huge. It was huge. It was like, that's impossible. You know, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> like it, 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 it was. When somebody was like, well, how Nagano is going to win this? Well, if Nagano can't knock him out, it's over. That's his only chance. Nagano ain't submitting him. Well, yeah. he actually potentially could have, you know. you know, looking It at was some, close there at a couple points. Yeah, he was. And then, like, Cyril Gunn went for a heel hook. <laughs> and Nagano just looked at it and was like, what is that? You know, like, <laughs> you're sitting here like, man. You know? <laughs> I'm like, good gracious. Like, nobody would ever thought that. And, you know, you just can't. And I, I'll make this same case for myself in a way. It's like when I fought, uh, it was my fourth amateur fight. I was going against TK Mattress, and it was going to be the first five-round uh, fight uh, for this Tennessee promotion ever. And we trained for five rounds, you know, mm-hmm. five three-minute rounds. We trained for it. And I'm sitting here like it, a lot a, a lot a lot of people thought the same thing. We're like, it's not going five <laughs> rounds. You know, it's just impossible. You know, it's not going five rounds. It's you know, I, I would finish him pretty fast, or I would get him in the second round at least, second or third round. And man, TK was tough, and TK fought hard, and um, I still I won every round. But we went all the way to the decision, and I was like, man, like really, like 
<laughs> if you would have told me we was going all five rounds, I wouldn't believe you. You know, and we did, and 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 I would say something like that, like fights like that, makes you better. You know, mm-hmm. I think because Nagano has saw him, seen himself go five rounds and win, that would make him that much better. It gives him that expectation what to see against a top tier. I mean, heavyweight title on the line in front of the world. Yeah. Yes, obviously. Like, you'll, be, you're, you'll gain more confidence. And I see, like, with myself, me going those five rounds, it gave me more confidence. Okay, I can go. I can go the distance, you know, because I was always finishing guys, you know. And I, and I want to continue to always finish guys. You know, it, now I'm in my pro career. You know, I got finished. I want to get a finish this next. I want to get continue to get finishes. You know, I don't want to be a – decision fighter i want to make sure i get finishes when i get you down i want to finish you when i i'm on the feet i want to finish i'm always looking for the finish and now you know you see that i me having that decision fight has made me better as a fighter and i feel like that would do the same for francis and you know you look at these heavyweight divisions i mean you don't see a lot of heavyweights Mm -hmm. going going to the full decision you don't i don't think Derek lewis and ty tavasa was ever going to get that point (laughs) no no like see that's another fight like Everybody that mama knew, like, there's no chance it's going to This is finish. ending in a finish. Yeah, it's just going to end in a finish. There's just no <laughs> chance. Like, no chance. You know? And if it would have went the decision, we all would have been like, it would have been like Derek Lewis and Agano. You know, we have been like, what? Just a head scratcher. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> is this right? But both guys feared each other power. It was more like, man, I got to be mindful. Nagano was mindful of Derek Lewis. I think because he just lost to Stipe. And, you know, he just wanted to be cautious. And Derek Lewis himself, like, a little cautious. Like, man, I don't want to get in that pocket a little too fast with Nagano. You know, you got to be ca- – I mean, you respect the heavyweight's power. So, and that's the same thing with me. I'm going to respect my opponent and in his skill set. But, uh, like I said, if I go in here and do me, then I will I will get the victory. You talk about doing you. And, and earlier you talked about there's it's fighters that you kind of see yourself – you see yourself in that you model your game after, and I, 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 just me personally, I'm not a big fan of the whole like I model my style after this. Mm-hmm. But are, are there any other fighters out there other than DC that you see yourself in in similar styles with? Because oh, yes. I, I know we he, he's a lightweight, and we were just talking to him before we went on air. But when I watch your fights, when I go on YouTube, I see them. Your style does remind me a lot of Mike Chandler. Mm-hmm. It's that high intensity aggressive you know Mike Chandler's a former all-american wrestler mm-hmm. he has that in there but he also has built the gra- built the the striking in there it built the aggressiveness so mm-hmm. i see that just from myself to you but are there any other fighters that you see that with yeah um, i actually like a lot of the different things michael chandler do i i i've watched some film on him here and there um a lot of my style i'm i'm big on pressure so um I'm big. I'm a big fan of all the Dagestanians. Mm-hmm. So all of Habib, <laughs> all of Islam, I can watch those guys all day long. So Habib Namargamedov, he's one of my favorites. He's mm-hmm. one of the guys I watch so much of. Uh, his ground game and how he controls people, I love that mm-hmm. stuff. Um, it's, it's it's beautiful to me, like how he's just able to control people against their will and they can't do a single thing about it. He takes them down. What can you do? You can't get up. What can you do? If I put you here, what can you do? Like, I watched this whole tutorial video he did, and it was, like, two hours long, and it's, like, three different volumes. And I'm, like, I watched every, I watched them all, like, multiple times. And <laughs> That's also a guy, the mindset uh, yes. uh, of the sport. I feel like yes. there's so much to learn from Habib. Oh, man, dude. It's it's beauty to the eyes. And it's, it's beauty to the eyes that are big-time grapplers and wrestlers. Mm-hmm. And guys who are not really into that, they're more in, like, to just straight-up striking. And, and when I look at striking, I look at striking – uh, to to set something else up, mm-hmm. and um, my striking is like I really do believe my striking is like has gotten really good. Um, I just haven't gotten an opportunity to really show it much in my mm-hmm. fights, only because I know what I can get to in my fights and what will help me get to win the fastest. Um, but whatever comes, you know, whatever comes, you know, and I, I feel like I'll be ready regardless. But I watch a lot of Habib, I watch a lot of Islam, I watch a lot of uh, DC, I watch a lot of. Uh, um, who else? Hazmat Shamayev. Hazmat Shamayev mm-hmm. is another guy I really enjoy. Look, Hazmat has become my favorite fighter. Right yeah, now. <laughs> you're not the only one. There's a lot of people uh, out there who would agree with man, you. Man, I love Hazmat, and I love like his style, how he walks forward, he take guys down, and he just mauls them. I, I love that. That that's my that's the style I want. Um, now I know I'm a little bit more explosive than some, and I want to. I want to have that mauling style with the explosiveness. I love that. Mm-hmm. I, I just love that. 
And so that would be if you would like to like try to describe me like, yes, he mauls you in, in an explosive way. And I would love to, you know, I just want to, you know, keep working on my game. I, I feel like there's a lot of pieces of my game that people haven't seen yet. And um, I feel like as time go on, if I get more fights, like trying to stay active, you'll get an opportunity to see that. And that's something you just mentioned, the explosiveness. You know, I've talked to a lot of you guys over there at Agogi, you know, Jazzy, I've talked mm-hmm. to as well, Matt, Logan, all you guys over there. And that I feel like that's the constant there it is it's always these super explosive athletes and they use the explosiveness as a major part of their game is that something that is 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 in the air there that that's taught or is that just happens to be happenstance between just all of you guys being there together well i'll tell you one thing you know you look at the thing here at agogi um we're there at agogi um we're a big grappling gym all right so we work on a lot of different phases in grappling and some of the moves that we require, I mean, you know, requires a little bit of explosiveness. You know, you just can't sit there and settle. You know, you got to be active. I'm always talking about in my kids' wrestling class is like activity causes openings. And you want to stay active. And sometimes you're active, you're active, explode. You're active, active, explode. Da, 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 da. You know, you, you, you're you constantly moving and then boom, you see the opening. Now we explode to it. And I feel like you have guys like, you know, Matt Harris with his style of jiu-jitsu, mm-hmm. uh, really, like, dominant, controlling, um, explode when needed. Sterling is – Sterling, like, I got a shirt on here, BJJ Hero. <laughs> uh, Sterling Peace, you know, he's more of the technical side. But even in Sterling – I mean, he's one of the most technical guys I've I've met, ever seen, Rose Jiu-Jitsu. And even with his technical side, he still used those explosive movements. And I feel like, you know, with us grappling so much, we really try to base a lot of the things we do in like a wrestling, almost in a wrestling uh, scenario. We always do a lot of grappling and then like a lot of refers to some certain things wrestling and certain things just pure jujitsu. But we're more of like wrestling with BJJ. And you, it's funny, you look at a lot of our guys that fight. You know, everybody, every time, you know, somebody fighting a gogi guy, they're like, man, those guys are really good at wrestling. And, you know, we do we do wrestling, but we don't do as much wrestling as you would mm-hmm. expect, actually. Um, but um, that's one thing you have to deal with when you fight in a gogi fighter. I mean, you deal with the wrestling and the BJJ, and, man, once we get you on the ground, that's where we feel comfortable. So Yeah, and and that's, that's something with a gogi is anybody can come in there and mm-hmm. get that base understanding of it. Yes. And, you know, obviously you have your, your upper echelon yeah, guys yeah, like yeah. you there who are out there yeah, competing yeah. and stuff. But, no, that, that's, I'm really glad that we have something like that. Yeah. Here in Chattanooga, because you go to a lot of places, just not there. Yeah, it's <laughs> in not some there for real. You're right. You know, sometimes you go to these other places and you you can't get that anywhere else. You know, I, I like I said, I think uh, we're just really blessed at a gogi because you go there and there's so much, like there's just so many opportunities you can do. It's not only in just the grappling, not only in the striking, but even in the weight area, like uh, PKP. You know, Peak Connect Performance. You know, you can go back there and work out. And I feel like great gym back there. Oh, great gym back there, man. Uh, Big time, big time, like help. Cole Strange back Uh, there. There you go. Cole Strange working out back there. You know, Gannon. So you got Gannon Hampton, John Hampton. uh, Both of those guys, they're back there. uh, And man, uh, they do a phenomenal job. You know, Gannon, he's the uh, head guy and he does a phenomenal job. And John does as well, helping us. And he got a few interns. And those guys really help really well not only just like for grapplers people that want to just go back there and work out but you got like young baseball athletes young football athletes or any any sport be honest with you any sport and they go back there and train and they see huge differences in their numbers from when they first come in like you see like uh, they'd be like oh i can only get my arm up this far give them about six seven (laughs) weeks their arms already back here you know like small things (laughs) like that the small stuff that can help you in your sport and that also helps when a lot of the Agogi guys are back there training as well, and as well as as the fighters. You know, we go back there and train. I train back there myself almost every day, and working out back there helps me out so much because it helps my explosiveness. It helps my flexibility. It helps my movement. And I, I like I say, I don't think I would be where, right here where I'm at without one Agogi and two PKP. Those those are yeah. two big pieces to my puzzle on why I have grown as a fighter. So, you know, you not only you got to have the skill, but you also got to have the physical conditioning part. And I feel like um, I am not lacking in that area, especially from uh, training with a Gogan and PKP. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> and now that we have the video, people can see. <laughs> uh, June 11th, Camp Jordan Arena. Torres, I got to ask, 
How do you see it going down? Oh, man, I love this, oh, this question here, man. I always say the same, man. So <laughs> whatever, whatever the finish shows, that is the finish that will be taken. Um, I feel like um, I'm going to go in here and do my thing, you know. Not, I'm not going to be a guy that predicts finishes. Um, you know, I'm never going to do that. But I do know one thing. By the end of that night, my hand will be raised, and I'll be marching on to my next victory. Um, uh, that's one thing I know for sure. Um, I train too hard. I work too hard. Um, I'm confident. Uh, I feel, like I said I'm already in this podcast, if the Punisher go in there and do what the Punisher is supposed to do, uh, I don't think anybody can beat him. And once I'm stuck in that mindset, once I'm ready to go, I, I don't believe there is anybody that can beat me at that position. And uh, I'm confident. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to fight. And I'm, I'm, I'm tired of waiting. Like, Saturday can't get here fast enough. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I can tell, man. You're ready to go. I'm ready to go. Ready to go. Ready. Torres Finney, the Punisher himself, joining us once again here on the Watch It podcast. I know there's some big changes coming here with ESPN Chattanooga in, in this podcast, but we're still going to be here. Torres, hopefully you're still going to be in here, and it's going to be good, man. I can't wait to talk to you again after this fight. Yes, sir, definitely, man. I also want to give a quick shout-out to uh, Logan Neal. Logan Neal is about to get ready for his upcoming title fight. He's the main event going against Pat Crompton. Uh, for the 155 Aries Championship. I'm excited for that. Can't wait. And uh, also excited for Aries for giving us the opportunity to be able to fight on their platform and uh, come here to Chattanooga and uh, give us the opportunity to be able to show off our skill set. So. I think we need to get next time you and Logan in here. Definitely. Yeah, I think that definitely. would be a good, that would be. good podcast. Speaking of good podcast, TNT. TNT podcast, <laughs> yes, sir. Definitely tune in to the TNT podcast. Uh, we've had we had a uh, we had a little uh, a lot of few a few people got a little mad at us when we talked about the Jimbo and Nick Saban. Uh, <laughs> you, you know you can't you can't attack Saban. You attack Saban, uh, people start coming at you You're like, dude. <laughs> but that was, I mean, I mean, I looked at that. I mean, the way Saban came after Jimbo, the Dion, yeah, little problem, little, little problem. But it, it is what it is. So I'm ready to go. Torres, man, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Jake. Anytime, man. Anytime, brother.